of you, as I said, Fair Labor Standards Act, that's really going to deal with our comp time and our minimum wage is what the jurisdiction of that is. Um, when you're thinking about it in terms of your employees there at the county, you want to always start with the presumption that everyone is non-exempt. That's your safest bet. If you're paying everybody an hourly wage and you're giving everybody time and a half or comp time, you're never going to get into trouble here. Okay, where we get to trouble is when you start calling people exempt or salary and you're not paying them overtime, you're not giving them comp time, and really they should have been receiving those benefits. That's your big exposure here. Uh, two parts to being exempt. You've got to meet the salary basis test. And that's $455 a week. If they're not making, uh, if they're not making that and the duties test, then they're still not going to be exempt. So they've got to be making at least that, and then they've got to have the duties test. And that's really what we're going to dig into. The bulk of the presentation will be over that. We're going to cover this real quickly. This is not non-exempt. Okay, non-covered employees. That's completely different from non-exempt. And so that means. Non-covered employees aren't even covered by the FLSA. Not that they're exempt from it, you just don't even matter. So if we're talking about elected officials, I know, right? <laughs> that came out bad. But you, you don't matter as far as the FLSA is concerned. So we're talking about elected officials, and we don't have any overtime concerns there. Uh, personal staff, policymaking, legal advisor, and legislative employees. So these are all listed in the statute. But what I want to tell you is if you have questions, about any of these four bullet points under elected officials, please call us and let's go over that because they're not as obvious as the titles make them seem, okay? So personal staff, just because you've got an assistant doesn't necessarily mean that's gonna be your personal staff as far as this exemption goes. But if you think that maybe they would fit under that or you just wanna know, you know, call and we can do an analysis of that position. So that's non-covered. So comp time, and I think we're all probably pretty familiar with this, is going to be anything over 40 hours in a work week. And so because we're counting, you can elect to do that as comp time instead of just paying money on their paycheck, instead of just paying the straight overtime. If you're going to do comp time instead of actual dollars on their paycheck, totally fine. You have to let them know ahead of time. So the law actually says there must be a pre-arranged agreement between the county and the employee, and that's no big deal. That can be in your policy, just a little one-liner that says, you know, overtime will be paid as comp time. Um, that can be something that you, if you don't have that in your policy, you can go back to the office, you can write up a memo, have everyone sign it, you know, stick it in their file, and that's good enough. Just something that puts them on notice that, hey, this is the way we pay our overtime. We pay it in, in comp time instead of actual cash money on your paycheck. Your ceiling of 480 hours, it doesn't mean they can't work comp time over that. So if you've got someone and they've actually banked 480 hours of comp time, they can still work overtime, but at that point, you've got to pay them cash money on their paycheck, okay? The reason is, is because we don't want you getting in a position where you've got these huge, massive banks of comp time, and people want to take that time off, and you can't approve it just because you can't deal with having that many people out of the office. Because what the big, the big deal about this law is that we're not just earning it to say we're earning it. It's actually wages that they've already earned because of the work that they've done. And so when they want to take that time off, you have to accommodate that as best you can. You know, it's not like vacation where you can kind of discretionarily say, no, this is not a good time. Unless you have an actual valid reason, you know, like you're the collector's office and it's tax season you know, or the assessor's office, um, or it's in the year, or it's budget season, you know, there's something going on and you've got to have all hands on deck, or too many people are off. If, if you've got really an employee crisis like that, you can say, well, let's push it, let's make it this day, et cetera, but you really have to try your best to give them comp time whenever they ask for it. Um, and, the, and I'm sorry, I did not, I did not state that, but 480 hours, that's for all of our law enforcement and fire protection, that sort of thing. 240, that's for your standard discount employees. 
The reason that it's 480 for emergency personnel is because we sure don't want the sheriff's office short staffed because they hit you know ceilings on comp time. So the law gives them a little bit more flexibility because we really want all of our emergency personnel to be able to be on the job when they need to be on the job, regardless of budget restrictions. Okay, uh, employees have to be allowed to use it when they request. We already talked about the in writing. When, ter when your uh, employment terminates, you've got to pay out comp time. So regardless of vacation, sick time, anything like that, you know, that's what does your policy say, that's what you do. But when it comes to comp time, your policy has to be that you pay it out. And again, because this is not a benefit, this is not vacation, this is not a gift you have given your employees. These are wages that they have earned for hours already worked. So that's why they have to be paid out. Um, Overtime carryover, these considerations here, so what, we're, what I'm talking about is what the law says you have to do, what the F um, But So for county considerations, the question that you guys have to ask internally is, can we afford to bank this many hours? Because again, you have to kind of be aware of if they quit, so if all your employees quit at the same time who have those really big banks of comp time, how is that going to hit the budget, and how can you guys afford that? So if you need to lower those ceilings, that 480 and the 240 down, you're certainly welcome to do that. Now, again, you still have to pay the overtime, but you pay it cash, so you still are incurring that expense, but at least you're incurring it incrementally instead of you know, potentially just at huge losses all at the exact same time. Okay, so this is going to be our three big exemptions. So this is how you get out of paying overtime, um, is if somebody is exempt. In our white collar exemptions, we've got executive, administrative, and professional. Now on the bottom, you see there's computer and outside sales. So those do apply to counties, you know, in, in theory, but I, I don't see where a lot of counties have outside sales people, you know, where we consider this or the computer employees, but we'll touch on it briefly just in case. So executive employees, again, they're all going to have $455 per week. Um, that applies to everybody. Primary duty is the management of the enterprise of a recognized department or subdivision. And so that's not just, okay, they're managing the county. I mean, it can be any, any separate department. And even within your office, so say it's the collector's office, if you have somehow broken that down into different subdivisions, if you have a specific HR department, um, and I know, I know the offices are smaller, but I'm just trying to give you examples. I know it may not be practical for this to exist frequently, but if you had a separate department, a recognized department within that office, they can manage that department even though it's not the overall, you know, collector's office or, you know, assessor's office. Uh, they have to regularly direct the work of two or more full-time employees. Now, this one gets a little goofy. It sounds pretty straightforward, but it, once we start talking about part-time employees, it gets a little goofy because we all know what a full-time employee is, but if you have part-time employees, if you add them all up together and they equal two full-time employees, then that counts as well. So if you have two part-time employees who are working 20 hours a week, you've got one full-time employee. But if you've got four and their hours total, you know, 80 hours, then you're gonna have two. So that's on the directing. And this is a big one has to have authority to hire and fire. A lot of times when I talk to a county, they're, they've got someone who's directing, but they don't have authority to hire and fire. All of that has to go through the elected official. Okay, So we know that that's going to be kind of the basic setup. Then the next question is, <coughs> in the parenthetical there, are there recommendations given particular weight? You know, we all have those people who kind of come to your office and they give their opinion, and sometimes that doesn't matter so much, right? And then you've got the people, when they come and give their opinion, you know, you're going to pay attention, and it's going to matter because you trust them. Because you're busy doing other things and focusing on different things, and so you have to trust their opinion on that, and you're going to give that some weight. So if, if it's that person, then you're okay. If it's the one that it's kind of like, oh, okay, thanks for sharing, you know, and you just go on about your business. I mean, you laugh because you know it's true. Yeah. There are those people, <laughs> the smile and nod at them, you know. Uh, yeah. That, they're not going to count uh, for this. 
So any questions on executive? Okay. Administrative, um, this, this is the most litigated uh, exemption under the white collar because it's the least clear out of all of them. Uh, again, $455 per week. Primary duty of performing office or non-manual work. I'm going to stress non-manual here because I know in the road department, you know, you've got a road department supervisor and they've got a lot of discretion, you know, and they run that department. But they also are doing a significant amount of blue collar work depending on the county. It, third time's a charm. Can you hear them? All right, we're good. Um, so if, if we're talking about the road department supervisor specifically, this is where I get a concern on this, is we need to look at how much non-manual labor are they doing versus manual labor. Because if your guy's out there and he's running the road graders and he's out there working with the crew and he's not just managing, managing them, then we're going to have an issue on this one. If he's truly in a managerial position and just kind of picking up the slack because everybody came down with the flu that week or you know something unforeseen happened and it's a real small percent of the hours he's putting in then you're going to be okay and primary duty includes exercise of discretion and independent judgment and so we'll just kind of stick with that road department supervisor example is he having to go back to the county judge every single time he wants to make a decision okay if not well what kind of decisions can he make on his own you know, can he make purchasing decisions? Does he make equipment decisions? Does he prioritize calls? Does he prioritize road issues? Um, it, it, the answer doesn't have to be yes to everything, right? He doesn't have to have complete discretion, complete authority, but he has to have a significant amount. Over 50% of what he does, he has to rely on his own independent judgment and discretion. Now, say on that purchasing example, so, so maybe you give him authority that he can purchase up to X number of dollars, and then over that, you know, he's got to go to the county judge. Things like that are okay, but it's just all a factors test. And again, that's why this one gets so hairy, is because there's no bright line for it. It's, it's just, it's going to have to look at the factual situation every single time and go through the analysis to find out. And that's why it's so, it's so mitigated is because, you know, reasonable minds can differ. We may think that, no, this looks good, and he finds himself a plaintiff's attorney that says, no, I don't think that's so good, and then it's got to get hashed out, you know, in court. Um, obviously, that's what we're going to try to avoid, but, again, that's why this one's so mitigated. This is still in that same prong, so here's an example when it says directly related to management or general business operations. This long list, these are all different examples of areas. So when we're kind of talking about those sub-departments or sub-areas within an office, you know, I'm not gonna read that whole list to you guys have it in the handout too, but they could be in any of those areas. Um, and even more, again, you know, road department's not listed up there, but that's obviously a subcategory of the judge's office. Um, so just kind of keep in mind that it doesn't have to be for your main office. It could be, you know, any type of breakdown that you've done inside of your office. Okay, here's the computer employees. And again, I, I have not yet talked to a county who have one. It doesn't mean no one does, especially maybe some of the bigger counties. Um, but this is not just your, like, IT guy the kind of help I need, like I can't turn on my computer today, it hates me, you know, basic help desk, kind of someone comes over, the volume's not working, or my internet's running slow. If you have that guy, that is not this guy, okay? This is kind of like next level computer stuff um, versus just your basic uh, help desk guy. So primary duty of, and there's four different subparts there, I'll be honest, this all goes so far over my head um, that I don't know what a lot of this means from a practical standpoint, except, again, I know that it's, the law is very clear in, in states, it's not your help desk guy, but application of systems analysis techniques, consulting with users, determining functional specifications, uh, design, development, documentation, I mean, you're talking about, you know, really, really in-depth, they've got word prototypes in there, that sounds very scientific to me, so that's, uh, you know, I'm not asking for prototype help. Um, design, documentation, creation, modification of programs, so you're talking about people who are writing actual script there and who are designing software, 
and any combination of the above duties. So if you think you've got someone who's really getting into kind of the nitty gritty of computer stuff, let's talk about it. Just because I don't understand what all the words mean, um, that's the great thing about legal research is it'll break it down for us and it, again, it'll be out there, it'll tell us. So if you can tell me the words, the description that your guy is doing, we can research it and find out how that's gonna line up with this exemption. Uh, not exempt using computer-aided design software, but they're not actually making design decisions. So if your guy makes your website from GoDaddy.com and he uses a template and he's not actually writing a script, but he's filling in the blanks and kind of important pictures and images and, and making it yours, but again, he's starting from someone else's program, that's not going to cut it. Uh, help desk personnel, Anything dependent on computers, but that doesn't actually deal with programming or systems analysis. So again, his entire job all day long may be just dealing with your computers, but we have to really get into what is he doing with the computers. And IT support responsible for diagnosing computer-related problems. Again, it's kind of my example of you know the things I need Mark Carroll for. My internet's running slow. This program won't open right, what's, what's not working here, and he goes through some sort of a checklist or, you know, searching, but if something's really broken, he's not the guy fixing it. You know, we've got to go to somebody else. And then this is our third on the white collar, on the ones we really, really deal with in the county, it would be professional. So one for learned professionals and one for creative professionals. Learned professionals, they must have work that deals with learning of an advanced type or knowledge. So what we're really talking about here is did you have to go to school to know how to do it, okay? And we're not talking about did you show up for a 48 hour you know, crash course and get your certificate that says you set through whatever training. I mean, did it actually require a degree and some sort of extensive training? Must be in a field of science or learning. And well, I kind of touched on the third one and, along with the first one, but must be customarily acquired by a prolonged course of specialized instruction. So not limited to, but teachers, lawyers, accountants, engineers, um, anyone in actuarial. So that's just kind of an example of, of who's going to be that. So like your county attorneys, those are automatically going to be in the professional exemption if they're working as an attorney. The other big thing on this that's not on this slide is that just because they have the degree just because they have an MBA, just because they are an accountant. If you've got an accountant, but they're doing more of a bookkeeping function that someone with less education could do, that's not gonna cut it. If you've got someone with an MBA in, but you've got them in a position where they're not actually using that degree, that's not gonna cut it. So you have to make sure that what they're doing actually requires this level of knowledge, not just that they have it. It's like if you took a PhD person and put them on the line at McDonald's, you know, it's like, yeah, they've got a PhD, but they're still on the line at McDonald's. And I mean, that's a really severe example. I mean, you know, that's not very realistic, but just to kind of give you the idea of how to think about that when it comes to the job roles is that are they using the education that they've got in their role as a county official or county employee, and if so, then you're good. Uh, creative professionals, we don't run into this much in the county, but I guess possibly, but performance of work requiring invention, imagination, well, that may apply, right? I think there's some definite imagination used in the county. Um, originality or talent in a recognized field of artistic or creative endeavor. So you've got your examples there. Again, actors, musicians, composers, et cetera. So I, I don't think we run into that very often, if, uh, if ever. No, no, I can say this. No one's called me with that question yet. You know? So if you've got that person, uh, no, no one's talked to me about it. Uh, I think this kind of falls in that category, too. Of we don't run into this too often in county work. And if so, raise your hand. Tell me what county you're with and if you're hiring. Okay. <laughs> uh, highly compensated employees. So total annual comp has to be at least $100,000, and then all they have to do is perform one of the exempt duties of any of the three other exemptions. So um, only one. So where the others, if they're not highly compensated, they really need to perform a majority of those duties that fall under those tests. But if they just perform one of them and they make enough money, then they're going to be considered exempt. 
And again, though, it is, it is related to non-manual work. So we're talking about white collar exemptions here. So if you're paying your road guy that much, that's still not going to cut. Okay, and we've, I've been drilling on this every time we go through, but this just breaks it down again. 455 per week, or that's 23,660 per year. And I just want to pause on this for a quick second. Um, I don't know if this was on everyone's radar or not, but a year or so ago, the DOL proposed to increase this, and it was going to be like 913 a week, I think. And it, I mean, it caused a national uproar, both in public and private sector alike. Uh, about 20 states joined in together, and they filed a lawsuit in joining this from going into place, this rule from increasing from 455 to 913, and that was settled, uh, you know, was fully finished back in the summer. I think August 31st is when they issued the ruling on that, and the court said, yes, the DOL exceeded its rulemaking authority by issuing that sort of a change. Um, it didn't say that they can't increase that, it just said that the increase was so large and so dramatic that in effect, it got rid of a lot of the exemptions, which was not the intent of the law. I mean, as written, the law obviously intends that there are exemptions. I mean, we got pages and pages of law on this, and so by jumping that up so much, it cut out so many people, they said no. The court didn't say what number they'd be happy with, they just said they weren't happy with 913. So what has happened now is the DOL, they're still going to increase this as their intent. They have uh, issued their intent to do the new rule back in September. It was open for public comment. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to find out from the public, from private sector, from public sector, from employers. They're getting comments from anyone they can to find out what is, what is reasonable. You know, we know this needs to go up some, but what is reasonable and, and what should we move it to? So... Um, I haven't looked into it in a couple of months here, so I don't know if that is completely closed, if that comment period is closed, or where they're at in that. But uh, at some point in the future, we're going to hear a new number thrown out there, and hopefully it's going to be uh, obviously much, much lower since this one didn't fly with the courts. But when that changes, uh, you've got two choices. When that goes up, you can either increase the salary of all of your exempt employees to match that number, which, you know, that can be a big deal, or you've got to make them non-exempt. And so if they're working those overtime hours, that's where they're going to have to get the comp time, you know, or the overtime on their paycheck. So when and if that happens, those are going to be the solutions. I will say this, uh, a lot of, I think it was more private employers than public, at least that's what I heard of was private. When that new rule came out, you know, good for them, they were trying to be proactive and preempt the rule going into effect and they went ahead and bumped up all their people. And so now there's a big question on, you know, can we go back and, and decrease their salaries since that didn't happen? Um, and you can imagine employees don't like that very much. So I would say when that, new, when that new number gets thrown out there, nobody panic and give everybody a raise right then and there. You know, let's wait and actually see, just like this last time, how it shakes out um, and make sure that you're not taking drastic action against the county budget when, you know, maybe it's not going to be as, as bad as you think. Okay, uh, an exempt employee must receive their full salary for any week in which they perform work without regard to the hours worked. So, your hourly people, obviously, you know, they work 40 hours, they get paid 40 hours. They work 35 hours, they get paid 35 hours. Now, you've got someone who's exempt under one of the white-collar exemptions, and they're scheduled, say, for 40 hours a week. But they only work 35 hours that week. You still have to pay them their full salary because they work that week. Now, you can have it in your policy that they need to take paid time off, um, you know, if they miss the full day or something like that, but you cannot incrementally dock their pay because they missed time, like if they came in 30 minutes late, you know, they left an hour early, they took a three hour lunch. You know, you can write them up, you can get mad at them, you can tell them don't do that again, you can fire them for breaking the rules, but you can't dock their pay in the meantime. These are the exceptions to that. Like I just said, if they miss a full day, if they're gone the whole day and don't perform any work, and they don't take vacation or sick time, you can back that out of their pay. You don't have to pay them for that day. If they come in and they work for two hours, and then they go home sick, 
you got to pay them for that whole day. When they violate a safety rule of major significance, so if they're really doing something serious um, and you've got to send them home for that, you can dock their pay, even if it wasn't the full day, say that they made whatever their infraction was at 11 a.m. and you send them home, you only have to pay them until 11. You don't have to give them that full day off. And when they're suspended for a full day or more for infractions of workplace conduct rules. So again, that one stresses that full day as well. So if they violated a major safety rule, you can do a partial, but if they violated some other rule and you suspended them for it, you still have to pay them for that day if they came in for part of it. Also, initial and terminal weeks of employment. So say they start on a Wednesday, or you fire them on a Monday, you know, um, you can go ahead and just pay them for whatever they worked that first week that they start or that last week that they work. You don't have to pay them their full salary. <coughs> and if they take unpaid leave under the FMLA, and this includes intermittent leave, okay? So if, uh, if they take a full day off, so a lot of us, you know, if someone takes FMLA leave, they're going to say, I'm going to have a surgery and I'm going to be out for five weeks. Well, obviously, you know, they're gone for five weeks. They're gone every day. They're gone all day. So that's easy to figure out. When they come back, say they have to leave for PT, you know, and they have to go two hours a day. But that's still classified under FMLA leave. Okay, so that can still count is you can still dock that time. So you calculate whatever their hourly would be, and then you can back out those hours as long as it was designated as FMLA. If it was just like regular sick leave and it doesn't have that FMLA designation, that's different. The FMLA is what triggers that. Does that make sense? Okay. This one is more of an FYI. I have not yet found this in existence in Arkansas, um, but it, it is part of the FLSA, part of the federal law, so I just do a quick slide on it. If there was a state statute or county statute that dealt with, let me make sure I use the words here, principles of public accountability, so it's going to be based on the fact that, you know, spending government money to pay people who weren't showing up, etc. And, and this is an and, so not an or, this is you have to, the statute would have to meet all of these things. And the employee accrues some sort of PTO, so vacation or sick. I think we all take that for granted, but it is possible to not be that nice and give everyone paid time off, you know. Employees, I don't think, understand, you know, the gift of that, but you can always remind them if they're being difficult. <laughs> Um, that requires pay reduction when PTO is not used. So it's also going to say, hey, you guys need to use your vacation time first. If you run out of vacation time, then we're going to dock your pay for it. And PTO is not used because of one of these reasons. So it's a pretty hefty test. Um, permission was denied or nobody asked for the time off. They exhausted their leave or they chose to use leave without pay. So if we ran across a statute like this, if something ever got passed, or an ordinance in the county, then that would be an exception to that you have to pay them because they were part of the day rule. Okay, so this is a whole different exemption. So we were talking about white collar exemptions. So we're not even under that heading anymore. We're in a whole different heading here, okay? And these are called the 207K or sometimes just the K exemptions. And they deal with public safety, they deal with fire, they deal with EMT, and they deal with law enforcement. So in the county, I think we're pretty exclusively going to talk about it in terms of law enforcement. Um, only applies if you work for a public agency. The reason this matters is if you're outsourcing any of the law enforcement work or fire work, um, and they don't, they're a contractor, but they're not actually working for you, then they don't qualify for this exemption. Employer has an established and regularly recurring work period between 7 and 28 days. I'm going to show you this because a lawsuit just popped up um, recently, I think in the month of November, where a county is being sued, and one of the allegations in it is that they did not have an established work period for their law enforcement officers. Um, and it was violations of the FLSA and dealt with overtime. 
you, you got to put it in your policy. If it's not in the policy now, then just write something up. Do an amendment to the policy. Do a memo. Write it down. Have your guys sign it. Stick it in their folders. Okay, stick it in their employment file. It's an easy thing to fix going forward. We just want to make sure it gets fixed. Uh, it can be 7 to 28 days. A lot of the counties that I've talked to go with the 28-day period, but it can be any day, any day mark in between. An 80-20 duties test cannot spend more than 20% of the time performing non-emergency work. So if your deputies, you know, help clean up and they kind of use some managerial stuff, take out the trash or, you know, whatever, um, as long as that's not more than 20% of what they're doing, then they're fine. As long as 80% they're actually doing public safety, then you're good. So this is pretty small up here, but it is in your handout. This shows you on the work periods what the maximum hours are. So for those who are familiar with the 28-day work period, it's 28 days and 171 hours. Well, if you don't pick 28 days, this chart breaks it down for you at what threshold it becomes overtime. So if you look all the way on the bottom, if you see seven days, 43 hours a week. So this isn't a huge change from the white collar exemptions, which are 40. You know, this is three hours difference a week is all we're talking about here. But what it's saying is that whatever work period you've picked, you don't have to pay overtime to your guys until they go over that number. So instead of calculating it at the end of every week, you can calculate it more. And again, that's because the law recognizes we don't ever not want cops on duty. We don't ever not want firemen on duty because we've got overtime issues, because we've got budget issues. And so it's more flexible with those types of employees to make sure that from you know, a government level where budgets are stricter sometimes on, you know, on wages and salary, that we've got enough people out there doing the jobs we need done. So again, just I, I really stress, just make sure that you've got some sort of policy written out as far as what your work period is going to be. Are there any questions on that? Okay. And I don't have this slide. I've added it into a different version of this presentation, but this has come up recently too. There is there's something called gap hours, and we've done a lot of research onto what that means and, and how that looks like and shakes out for county employees. So one scenario, well, let me ask first, how many, do we have anyone from sheriff's office or sheriffs in here? Okay, just one. Okay, well, y'all can go spread the good news back to the office, okay, um, or tell them to call us. But um, a lot of sheriff's departments that we talked to recently on this, they schedule their guys for 40 hours a week. But they've also set a 28 day slash 171 work period. And so we know that's 43 hours a week, right? But they set it, they set their schedule for 40 hours. If they have the guys work longer, they're using that overtime at the 171. So what happens is if, if they're getting paid, you know, I'm not good at math, so let me think of just a good round number here. You know, say that they're getting paid $500 a week for 40 hours a week. You know, they're getting $2,000 a month on that. And you have to have them work the overtime or the extra hours up to 171. That's 43 hours a week. And you still only pay them $2,000. Well, you know, the question is, is that okay? And the answer is not, it's not a yes or a no. It's, well, we got to ask some more questions, right? So the FLSA only has jurisdiction if you're not paying minimum wage, and if you're not paying overtime. FLSA does not have jurisdiction over these gap hours, unless when you average all that time worked out, it equals less than minimum wage. So if you don't pay them for those extra 11 hours that they've worked, but when we do our math, and it's not less than minimum wage, you're okay under the FLSA. Now, you could potentially be exposed, possibly, you know, under a different theory. I have not found the case on it yet, so that's good news. Um, you know, it means that it's not, I find a lot of litigation out there on the gap hours, but everyone tries to bring it under FLSA, and it's very clear you can't do that, okay? But if you hire your guy, and you say, 
Our work schedule is 28 days, 171 hours, and this is how much money you get paid. It's real hard for him to complain when he has to work 171 hours and that's what he gets paid, right? Because that's what you told him. But now let's look at it a different way. And this is all about positioning. We're going to talk about the same money here, the same dollars, the same hours, but it's how did you position it. If you hire him and you said, you make $15 an hour and you work 40 hours a week. Well, when you make him work 43 hours a week and you don't pay him, for those extra three hours, he doesn't understand that. I mean, you know what I mean? It's, it's like you, you set it up that he is an hourly employee and that these are the number of hours that he works. And so you're going to have some morale issues, and that's a lot of what I hear feedback from the counties is that they end up with a group of deputies who are pretty ticked off because they started thinking about it, and the deputies use terms like we're being forced to volunteer time or work for free. Um, you know, never good things to hear. So I say it all comes back to positioning, and if you position it correctly, really what's happening is you're giving them three free hours of vacation a week, right? I mean, if you're paying them X number of dollars for up to 171 hours that month, but you're not making them work the full 171 hours, you know, and that's a much better way to position it versus, hey, you guys have to volunteer 11 hours of your time, and we're so awesome, we're not going to pay you for it. You know, and it's just now you're awesome or, you know, we hate you. I mean, it's just, it's all about how the employee is going to look at you um, as the employer. So, and so it's, it's all about positioning on that. There's no exposure under FLSA. You know, maybe a creative complaint could get you on implied contract or something like that, depending on, you know, what type of documentation is in the file or not. But definitely just from a morale standpoint and from having your employees happy about the way they're getting paid and understanding it, you know, it, it's good to have that position correctly up front, I think. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Under the... Yeah, and we're... Oh, you know what? I don't have the slides. I've got... it For anyone who's got specific questions on that, I have a different version of this PowerPoint that really breaks down into that because, yeah, the jailers are going to fall under that. Um, I, there's like three or four slides that I've got on that, that that goes into it. So if you give me your email address uh, before you leave or after we're done, I'll get you that because it breaks down the test for that. Again, it's going to be on a duties test and depending um, on what exactly. So one of the duties for law enforcement office, officers, for example, talks about you know the ability to arrest and they're carrying firearms and stuff. And so jailers maybe don't fit in to necessarily all of those. So then they made a separate category and said that jailers will still qualify for the exemption, um, but under their own test. So yeah, anyone who wants more details on this, just let me know afterwards and I'll get your email and send it to you. Okay, travel time, um, and this one can get a little goofy too. General rule, employees should be compensated for travel time unless it's overnight and outside of regular working hours. The DOL has a fact sheet on this, and I took most of this information just straight off of their fact sheet. Their fact sheet has more examples on it, but I tried to just put the basic ones. So if anyone's got some real detailed questions about this, let me know, and we can go over specific scenarios, or I can get you the DOL fact sheet as well. Um, travel time at the beginning or end of the work day, you know, it's not compensable to and from the work side. And that's, I mean, that's pretty common, since we don't let people check in from home and drive to work. You know, and, and get paid, and you got to show up, and then you get paid. So really, we're only going to be talking about travel time when it's a day like today. So if you've got any non-exempt employees here today who came down, um, that would be considered travel time. So then that's when you have to kind of go through this. So if they've got to go to a meeting place where they pick up materials, equipment, etc., before going to work, their time starts at the meeting place. So you know, instead of just coming straight to the office you need to go and you meet somebody at Office Depot and you're picking up supplies for the office or you've got to do a store run and you know get paper supplies, something like that. Once you get there, whatever that starting point is, that's going to be where they are going to clock in and clock out from. Or not clock out, but clock in from. And so that's where their day is going to start. Now travel during the work day, if it's before or after the work day, not for the benefit of the employer, then it's not compensable. 
So that means that if it is before the work day and it is for the benefit of the employer, then it would be compensable. So, you know, again, coming here, you know, you leave your house and you drive down here. Well, then it gets, here's where all of our math comes in. So, which I've already warned you, I'm not very good at. But, um, so say that it took you two hours to get here, but it normally takes you 30 minutes to get to work. So, you're not gonna get paid two hours of travel time, because it normally takes you 30 minutes to get to work anyways. We're gonna subtract the time it normally takes you to get to work, and then you're gonna get paid the travel time that's in excess of that. Now, no one ever complains when you pay them too much. I mean, that is just a fact, right? No one ever complains. So, you always have the option of making a simpler policy and just saying, you know, you get paid instead of getting on MapQuest and it took you 17 minutes and we're gonna back that out from your hour and 53 minutes. Um, you know, you can pay them for all of the travel time. Whatever you do though, make sure it's consistent and just make sure you're paying them the minimum. But again, you know, they're, they're not gonna complain if your travel policy is gonna be a little bit more flexible than what the FLSA allows. Uh, work performed while traveling, so counted as hours worked. Um, again, examples here, we've got truck driver, et cetera. Um, except during bona fide meal periods where they're permitted to sleep and adequate facilities and all that. A bona fide meal period is gonna be uh, 30 minutes under the FLSA. So if you're, you know, if, they, if they've got a lunch break, you don't have to pay them for that. If, if you go to a conference, so like for example, today's conference, we do have a lunch break but we might be doing some work that might carry over into our last speaker or next to last speaker of the day. And so you would, you would, would pay them for that. If we didn't have a lunch break provided here and you weren't gonna be sitting in here and we weren't maybe gonna be talking over you eating a little bit, you wouldn't have to pay for that because they're released for the lunch period. And so again, that's kind of where, you know, it can get real detailed when you're talking about travel and different examples of that. So let me know if y'all have specific, uh, specific question. And out of town travel, again, it's, it's all pretty straightforward um, and in your hand that I'm not gonna read all of that to you. But if it's a regular working day during normal hours, you got to pay that, but also corresponding hours on non-working days. So say that they're traveling and they don't normally work on a Saturday. Well, but they're doing work on that Saturday or traveling on it. You have to pay them during their regular work hours, even though it's a Saturday on a non-working day. If they regularly work 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, you know, travel time. And that's the example there of the bullet above. So, yeah. Quick question. Yes. This is going to all be in your developing policy that no, we didn't put the because this isn't this isn't a policy. Um, that's a good question. She asked if this is going to be included in the model policy, and it's not. And the reason why is because this isn't something that goes into effect because you adopt it. It's not something that um, you know there's an option on really. It's just saying this is what the law is. So we haven't reiterated the law on this. If it's something that you would like, because it does, I mean, it does provide clarity. So I see the point to why you maybe want it. What we can- We've got one person that's been doing it for years and years and years, but nobody else in our county that's taken advantage of that. Yeah. And, or would know. I mean, sure. You know, if you're getting elected every two years, you've got new people coming in and going and what have you. This is really pertinent yeah. information that everybody should know on the front end, especially when they first get elected. Absolutely, yeah. If you know, and with the policy, and Colin will explain this too. Um, but with the policy, if there's anything, we can tweak this, right? This is just a model. It's just kind of that. Here you go. Here's here's kind of the big important things to keep you out of federal court and state court too. Um, but we can add this in. So, like I said, this language is pulled straight from the Department of Labor's fact sheet. So when you get the policy and you want to add this into it, just let us know and either our office or Mike's office can work and get the language just added into a section in there and that's no big deal. And, and that goes with anything in the policy too. If there's stuff you guys want to add to beef it up, we can certainly do that. Well, I have one other question. Yeah, you're fine. There's got a lot of issues going on. Yeah. We want to everybody be an hourly employee in the county okay. for the first time because we've got a new software program for a county. So you've got the road department that works 10 hour days. Yeah. 
but they allow uh, 30 minutes for a lunch break, so they work from 7 to 5.30. Okay. So they're really, it's really not just 10 hours, it's a 10 and a half hour sure. schedule. But then you've got your sheriff's department that works 12 hour shifts, but how are we addressing their lunch break? They're getting paid supposedly for 12 hours, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, if they do, so I'm going to repeat the question in case anyone didn't hear it. She was saying that, you know, the road department is scheduled for 10 and a half hours, but they only get paid for 10 because they take a 30 minute lunch. Sheriff's deputies are scheduled for 12 hours and they get paid for 12 hours. Under the FLSA, um, when they call it a bona fide lunch period, and I use kind of my air quotes there because that's the legal term of it, it's a bona fide lunch period, it has to be 30 minutes of uninterrupted. If on the 29th minute they take a phone call, it's over. You gotta pay them, okay? It's not, you either gotta start over or you gotta pay them. You can't add another minute on the end because the law stresses that word uninterrupted. Okay, so with, with the road department guys, and I'm assuming, I'm gonna make an assumption here, if this is not the case, then that would be incorrect. But as long as their keys are out of the dozer, they go to lunch, you know, I'm guessing they don't have cell phones, most of those guys, they're not taking any work calls, they're not checking email, they are off the clock, and nothing is gonna pull them away, you know, from their fried chicken, or whatever they're eating that day. You know, I mean, they're just, they are on, they are off the clock, leave me be. Okay, well, you've got your deputy, and he's, you know, I don't think he ever gets away from that radio. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but my perception of them is that that radio is like attached. It's like a new appendage when they go on the clock, right? So at any moment, they have to answer that. They have to, so they're really on call during the lunch break, and they're able to be recalled to duty at any given time. So that's how you pay, why you would still pay the deputies. Now, if they're... But what if it's a jailer or a central dispatch and they actually do leave? then it would be the road department scenario. So if it's a jailer or central dispatch, they're leaving their desk, they're not subject to recall during that period, they're not answering the phones, then you would treat them the same as the road department. So there's no special treatment by virtue of being a law enforcement, there's special treatment as in you get paid for that lunch time if you're subject to recall. So even a receptionist, you know, or the front desk gal, she could be subject to that too, because if she's got to eat at her desk, and maybe 30 minutes go by, and blessedly that phone doesn't ring, but what if it rang 10 times? You know, she doesn't know, but she's on call. Like, she can't just leave. She can't, you know, get on another phone call and just be occupied for 30 minutes. She has to have an ear out for that. Um, so that would be an example where she would be treated just like the deputies in this scenario. So really the question is, do they have 30 minutes with which to go do whatever they want during that time, or are they subject to recall and having to pick up the phone or you know answer a call and, and begin working again during that time? If they clock out, so like I said, it's got to be bona fide, so 30 minutes, but talking about breaks here, um, if it's 20 minutes or less, then that can be uh, that that can be considered a break, but it has to be paid. So if you're giving them breaks, um, you know, it's 15 minutes, we'll say that they went over and they took, you know, 18, 19, 20 minutes, that still has to be paid, the break, if it's 20 minutes or less. So just kind of to throw in there, there's not a slide on that, but just as we're talking about the, the lunch time. So you guys have any other questions on any of that? Yes, sir. Road department, working 10, 14 hour days, they actually take half hour for lunch. They come in early and take that. They're sitting in their grave having their lunch. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is, if you pay them, like my road when we didn't call them, it's fine, but if you call us in, we actually owe them that 30 minutes. So you're saying that they're still on call during that lunch break. They aren't allowed to leave their equipment. That's kind of like their desk. You know, they they have to stay in that piece of equipment to listen for a call. They have no way unless they want to walk because they're up in the mountains. Well, true. Yeah, true. I mean, really. So I'm just curious about it. It's not a difference. Well, and I think that what you're talking about, if they stay in the truck, because practically speaking, where are they going to go? That's different from their supervisor saying, stay at your station and be ready for me to tell you to get back to work. So you can allow an employee, you know, even the 
front desk gal, the example I just gave, you can let her work at her desk, or sit, not work at her desk, sit at her desk during lunch, okay? So she can sit there. That's not the same thing as being on call. Eating at your desk or eating in your equipment, you know, is different than, does she have the discretion to not pick up that phone? You know, does he have 30 minutes, like, could he get on a phone call and just know for a fact he could take a personal call for 30 minutes, or is he going to have to hop off, you know, at any given time? I mean, is that really his time? So, yes, I get what you're saying. He's still at his workstation, but I think as long as he's got a 30-minute break, you know, that you can, you can, he can clock out for that. And also, just to stress you, I occasionally get questions on this. The 40 hours when we're talking about white collar and even your, you know, your 171 or whatever you fall, wherever you fall on that chart, you know, it's hours worked, okay? So sometimes I get the question of, well, they worked 40 hours, but they worked four tens, and then they took a vacation day, so they got paid for 48 hours that week. But it's only 40 hours worked. Okay, so if it was, you know, 34 hours worked and an eight-day vacation day, well, that gets you over 40. But again, it's not the hours worked. So you look at the total hours paid, but then you have to, for overtime purposes, you have to actually look at, forget about the pay, look at hours worked, and that's when you're going to hit it. And you can set your work week however you want, okay? You can change this in your policy if it makes sense for you, usually for the office settings, it doesn't matter, but sometimes with different types of jobs or different types of positions, it can matter, but you've got to have just the same one overall for that area. But you can have your work week be Tuesday through Monday, it can be Sunday through Saturday, it can be however, and even if that somehow means that you end up paying less overtime, you know, employees can't complain about that. As the employer, you have the discretion to set that work week, but you have to keep it. You know, if every three months you change it around because you find out, well, now I'm paying more overtime and I want to get away from that again, and it looks like you're trying to circumvent overtime laws, the courts really frown on that and they're going to say, no, you know, that's not a bona fide work week. But as long as you've got your work week set and that's just what you're using, then you're fine, even if it does manage to save you guys some money, you know, in overtime. Is there any other questions on that step or anything? All right. So, plan of action, evaluate exempt versus non-exempt. I mean, I really encourage this. Does everyone, let me do this. Raise your hand if you do not have non-exempt employees in your office, if everyone's considered exempt. Oh, good. Okay, everyone's got non-exempt. That means there's a really good chance we're doing it right here. I actually, I actually gave this presentation once, and like everyone raised their hand. They're like, no, we don't have non-exempt. No. Oh, no. <laughs> so that, that is good. But now look at your exempt employees. And you want to go through, and if you, know, if you feel good about them, if you feel questionable about them, you know, give us a call, and we can help you evaluate that position. The thing with the FLSA is on statute of limitations, and I know that's such a dirty legal word here, but you know, it, normally you've got like a three-year, right? We just kind of know, okay, if we, if we can get three years past whatever we did wrong, we should be good. Okay, well FLSA, it, it does work that way. It's got the same statute, but what makes it really scary is that the last time you messed up on their pay has to be within three years, okay? So as long as you got it right and you made it all the way, you know, almost past it, but then what happens is say that it's like been two years and 10 months, okay? But before that, you were messing it up for like 20 years, and this is, you know, the world's most tenured employee that you just could never shake, okay? They just stuck around forever. Well, because one event on that pay occurred within that three year, they get to go back and they get to pull in all those years of that pay. And so there can be some pretty big, you know, damages in these cases when you got tenured employees. So I would especially take a good look at those if any of your tenured employees are exempt, and let's just make sure they're being classified correctly. Um, and just kind of another disclaimer there, that while the RMF is happy, and more than happy and willing to talk any county through this stuff, and make sure it's being addressed right, 
Wage and hours not covered by the general liability policy we offer, and so that falls onto the county when those lawsuits come up. So that's why we try to do a lot of trainings like this throughout the year to make sure everyone's good on it. Because does it come up often? No, hardly ever. But when it comes up, you know, it can be a really big deal and it can hit a county hard. So we want to make sure that you know if you're not doing it right, we've got ways we can fix it now. We've got ways we can fix it that are very um, unobtrusive and don't you know have big shining glowing blinking arrows pointing to like right here we messed up you know we've got some pretty you know low-key ways to get you back on track and um, so again I really stress if y'all have questions you call us you call my rainwater you just you talk to somebody and let's make sure that we're getting it uh, situated for you okay do so you guys have any other questions yes ma'am Yeah, it, it doesn't matter if you designate them part-time or full-time for the FLSA. What the FLSA cares about is what are they really working. So you may designate them as part-time and that affects benefits or vacation or something like that. But, you know, say that a lot was going on and you had to bring them in for extra hours, they still fall under that same work week. So anything over that 43-hour work week mm -hmm. would be overtime? Yeah. Because I'm fighting with our administrator on that. Yeah, no, it would, be, it would definitely be overtime. Okay, so you evaluate. We've got another slide on there, and I'm not going to go through that, you know, in detail, but this kind of talks about best practices and policies. There's one on here that I want to stress because this, this one scares me just about as much as, you know, when people say they've got no non-exempt employees, okay? And this is accurate timekeeping by employees, okay? If your people, I don't care what department, anybody, if they're turning in, they work eight to five with a one hour lunch every day. I'm gonna tell you that's not right, okay? Nobody works eight to five every day with a one hour lunch. They work 7.58 and they take a you know hour and two minute lunch and they leave at 5.03, okay? No one clocks out at five o'clock on the dot every night and in at eight o'clock every morning. I mean, maybe, maybe sometimes, you know, maybe occasionally it hits just magically on that. But what happens is if you get into any sort of like legal trouble on this where a court or a plaintiff's attorney is going to be looking at your records, I mean, they are going to call BS on that and they're going to say, well, so you obviously did it wrong, so we're going to take the employee's word for it. And guess what? They've got this cute little notebook. They're going to pull it out of their pocket and, you know, they're going to use all different colors of ink in there and it's going to look like they've been keeping that record for five years back and it's going to have all the real time they worked. It's like the second set of books, right? Okay? And so we know that you're lying and we know that you know you're lying because nobody really believes people work eight to five. And so now we automatically are going to give more credit to this little mead notebook with all these hours in it. So I really, really stress if you are seeing timesheets, you know, if you're in the clerk's office and you're seeing them come across your desk, or just if you're in any other office and you're signing off on those timesheets, you, know, you really need to stress to your employees they need to keep accurate time. You know, and if that means you get stuck paying a little bit more overtime or dishing out a little bit more comp time, you know, so be it. But it keeps you out of actual, you know, legal trouble. It keeps you out of a potential lawsuit. Um, and you can always, if somebody turns out that they're going to hit overtime, you know, let them go home half an hour early on Friday or whatever. I mean, there's ways around it without really messing up the budget. Have them take a 15-minute longer lunch every day that week. Um, you know, there's, there's small ways to fix those incremental changes without having to go straight to an overtime pot. But, again, what the courts really, really like to see is that it's true timekeeping. So the best way is if you've got an electronic way to take time, you know, have them clock in and clock out. But if they're doing manual, just make sure it's not, you know, a straight, clean, perfect clock in, clock out, one hour lunch because nobody's buying it. Yes, sir. Our system doesn't take time, it just says how many hours did you work? Mm -hmm. It's electronic. And they put down ACE. Yeah. And then they so, sign off on it. And they and sign off on it. Then we sign off on it because they verify what they turned in was right. Yeah, I, I would encourage a different system. I see what you're saying that it doesn't allow for a specific time in and time out, and it's eight. But I think it's just that idea that nobody worked exactly eight hours. And so 
it's you've got a stronger legal defense if you can show no they they told me they got in at 759 you know or 803 and, and when you've got those times even if you round it all up you can have rounding in your system that allows it to go to a solid eight if it's close um, but I, I would really prefer to see from a legal standpoint a system that allowed for a specific check-in time and check out even if they did it at the end of the day you know it doesn't have to be a time clock but just something that allows them to give actual times. And how much rounding is allowed? It's, there's actually like a rule on it, and so I'm gonna tell you the best I can off the top of my head, but it's like if there's a 15 minute, you know, then it's like seven minutes would round back. So if I clocked in at 8.07, I really would get paid starting at eight, but if I clocked in at 8.08, .08, then it jumps forward to 8.15. I think there's, and if I remember right, I'm gonna have to look this up, just because again, I'm going off the top of my head. But I think you can change, I don't even think it has to be set that way. What the DOL is saying is that they just want some sort of rounding that's fair and consistent, um, and that's an example of it. But I think you can use different times, like you can say, okay, if you clock in at, you know, 8.05 or whatever. The idea is that even though if you clock in at 8.08, .08, you technically lose seven minutes because now they're not getting paid to late 15. What the DOL's opinion letter on it states is that it makes the assumption that it all is gonna even out, that sometimes they lose seven minutes and sometimes they gain seven minutes, you know? And that at the end of the day, at the end of the year, it's all gonna even out some. So as long as the system is fair and it's being applied, you know, across the board, you're good.